Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. Hello. Welcome, welcome. I'm Adam Steele for Hot Pole Studios, and this is the Hot Pole Podcast, the music tech podcast where we talk about this week's guitar news, music tech news, a bit of computery stuff. And joining me this week is Christian Taylor. Hello. Hey, I'm back. Yeah, welcome back. Welcome, welcome back. I am cracking open a lovely Guinness. Uh, it looks like Chris is drinking something uh, a bit more uh, sober. <laughs> Refined indeed. Black coffee. Yes. Hi everyone. How I, 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 upstairs. <laughs> I, I don't know how you can do black coffee at this time of night. I would die. It's gone eight. It's gone eight p.m. I drink a lot of black coffee, but any time after about three p.m., I'm then awake for a day. So, uh, yes, oh, I know. I need to let my uh, my evening drink settle. Nice. Ooh, yes. Oh, you can see it settling. Oh, that's the best. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, um, it's been a hell of a week and I need a drink. Um, <laughs> I, f- I finished uh, a part of the Celestian video this afternoon, the, the graphics yes. bit. Um, a lot of people will have seen a still on, on Instagram or wherever uh, where I've composited uh, the graphics for this Celestian, mm. Celestian video now. There are 25 speakers... And there are six, um, six different performances, and each right. one, yeah, for each one of those, it's a vertical stack of six clips, which oh, is no, yeah, I know. Th- three three videos, one of the speaker, one of the actual amp setup, and one of the player. Yeah. Uh, then it's got the background for everything. Uh, then it's got two layers with text on one layer that is what speaker it is and details of the speaker and one layer that's the player and details of the amp that they're playing through right yeah so what the viewer is going to see is one thing that they can read that looks pretty but what i have to do is six times six times 25 Ah. yeah i i think that's got to be a fascinating one to look at the actual project Mm. so are they so, did you get clean DIs from everyone, or are they yes. all in the... In the yeah, I did, there? yeah. So, funnily enough, I'm doing the whole project kind of backwards. I've got all the clean DIs, and I've not reamped them yet. Okay. <laughs> so, I've done all the graphics kind of in preparation. I've got a Reaper project now that's got about 150 channels in it. Wow. Yeah, it's getting a bit silly. <laughs> but it should work out okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be mental uh, because, yeah, some of them have given me just like a single guitar. Some of them have given me a guitar and backing. Some of them have given me a double track guitar and backing. Uh, one of them, Jamie's given me a solo and rhythm and backing. Oh, wow. So, yeah, which is great. It means I can show more things. But just if I decide to show another thing, that's like an extra 25 minutes to go into the video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> each time it's just, a, yeah. it's just the way it scales oh i've added a solo great that's how many different reamps and how many exactly different videos that you go oh man so. yeah so i've kind of worked it all out so the reaper project is getting ridiculous in fact let's just see i'm gonna go over to the screen for the news uh but just briefly oh no i can't open reaper i've not got my eye lock installed oh dear. but <laughs> well, my eye locks in my bag, and that'd be a whole thing to set that up. Yeah, uh, but, mine's in the other room, so I can't say anything. Yeah. yeah, I've now got I think it's five, no, four amps all set up ready. Yeah. Uh, I've it's funny this this room here is actually getting more and more empty every day because we're we're preparing to move house now. Yes. So the uh, so the studio is getting more and more and more uh, full of stuff, where I'm just kind of <laughs> offloading stuff down into there. Oh god! Mm. But yeah, the the other thing about this project, you've you've done warp stabilizing in Premiere before, haven't you? Yes, um, a, a, quite a while ago. Okay, well, it's uh, not that it, different. It's it's the same thing. Warp stabilizing is when you've got footage that's very slightly shaky. Uh, yeah, it can analyze it and then make it magically not shaky, which is great. Um, C sec, but <laughs> well, yeah. So what? Not shaky. Well. If if yeah if it's if it's on pretty extreme footage yeah, so mm. I've got a motorized slider and all these pictures of the speakers, all these videos of the speakers are on the slider. But it turns out the slider at points was like a tiny bit jerky, 
Not, oh, okay. Not oh, enough. To, yeah, not but... enough to be a real problem, but enough to bug me. So I thought, you know, a warp stabilizer, it does something like a 1% zoom in and it makes it perfect. Yeah. So I was like, yes, great. Then I realized all of these, they're all in 4K for a start, which takes yeah. a massive toll on your computer. And yeah. I've got three clips per speaker times six times 25. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I uh, let's see if it'll even do a display capture for that display. Uh, display two. It should do it for that display. Yeah. There we go. So you can see that for a minute. That <laughs> that timeline there. That's just the speaker playbacks. So if I hover over one here, it should take a second to sort it all out. It's just trying to load it all up now. The poor thing's uh, panicking. Go on. It, we'll get there. I wonder <laughs> if it'll even load. It might not because I'm running OBS at the same time. Hopefully it will. It's just having a panic, but it's... Uh, this is how you've long done it's... A, you've done a live stream video at it, haven't you? Before. Uh, is that through OBS? Yes. Whether it worked or not, uh, what, with different program versions and driver versions and stuff, I don't know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm. Looks like uh, Premiere is absolutely hammering a single core. Might come back to that in a minute. Uh, yeah. So if it comes up, but yeah, it's um, I've got thirty-two gigabytes of RAM in this computer, and it was being a real trooper. But I loaded it up with seventy-five clips to stabilize earlier, and it it took over an hour, and it just kind of locked me out for an hour. God. It pretty no. much just kind of said, "Right, I'm busy." <laughs> so back in the back in the day, an hour to do that much. That's not bad. Yeah, it's you know? not bad at all. This laptop's more powerful than anything we ever had. There we go. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so there you go. That's the Celestian A type with the details of the amp that I'm using with Jamie. Yep. And yeah, I don't think it'll play this back even at a quarter resolution at the moment, but it doesn't matter how long the export takes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, uh, another anon says stabilizers crop a bit though. Yes, they do. But if you look at this, it's actually inside a frame and it was 4K footage to begin with, which is partly why I did it in 4K because if it crops a little, I don't have to care. Sure. Mm. And so, yeah, that playing back, if it'll play back. I've hit play. Let's see what happens. Our survey says. Oh, yeah. So it, it doesn't like it. it kind of kind of plays it back a little bit funny there yeah uh when it's in full resolution though it is in the right place um, yeah yeah but you try that in full resolution with all this going on and it's a bit much mm. but yeah this is the six layers so that's that's layer one uh that i've just turned off so that's uh yeah. the player then we've got the text for the speaker type yeah then uh, i've locked the background but the background actually rendered out I rendered out a 20 minute sequence for the background, which took nine oh, hours. Cool. Mm. Wow. Mm. After Effects? Uh, yes. So I did that in After Effects and I exported it in a format that has alpha. So you can see how that actually kind of crops. Yeah. yeah. So it covers the video up in the appropriate okay. places. So it's, it's always perfectly framed. That's pretty cool. That's an look, interesting idea, actually. Yeah, it was a big file. It's like 50 gigabytes for a 20-minute sequence. Wow. But, um, yeah, it was originally an After Effects layer, and it was just grind into a halt. Because it's actually got five layers of color on that, uh, which are all, like, um, they all evolve over time, and the whole thing changes color. Yeah. And then, yeah, I've got my three videos underneath. <laughs> so, yeah, cool. that's been, that's one clip. And if I zoom out and out and out and out. Yeah. Now you get an idea of the scope <laughs> of this. Uh, that took me two days. <laughs> <laughs> the setup. Yeah. It's not even finished. <laughs> yeah, that's not even got the sound in yet. And that's, that's, <laughs> so the reason that I've done it this way around is when I get to filming the rest of the video, I can then just pick and choose the bits that I need from here yeah. And just just paste them in to the right place. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that I've, I've essentially got kind of a library of examples here, but they they make no sense out of context. Yeah. 
but it doesn't matter. Well, I could have done I, the animated background with Plane 9. I don't know what Plane 9 is. But yeah, I, I did it in After Effects because I know After Effects, I have it, and it didn't cost me anything in assets. So there you go. Um, exactly. I'm just close that down. But yeah, it got to the point where it was using 31.9 gigabytes of RAM out of 32 earlier, <laughs> and it wouldn't wouldn't do anything. The mouse actually froze at one point, and I was thinking, oh no, I've killed it. Oh wow. But it came back, <laughs> and it works. So there we oh. go. Happy days. I'm oh, we got gonna... more people. Join. Yeah, hello, hello everybody. <laughs> file in, file in. Um, oh yeah, there you go. Um, YouTube's moaning about the current bit rate; it can get lost. Um, <laughs> lovely. So yeah, I hope everybody's well. But yeah, in between that and the, we put the video out for Lyric Studio, uh, which was entertaining yesterday. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they reached out to me during now and were like, "Hey, we've got this thing. Do you want to try it?" And I was like, "Yeah, I." I used to sing, and I should sing more, but I don't make my own songs, because who comes up with words and doesn't just cringe? Oh, that I leave that to someone else. I don't think I've ever actually wrote lyrics. There you go. Um, I've tried a few times, but they always just make me cringe, and I never quite finish it. So I thought, you know what? I've got this thing. I'll play around with it. Because having been, having been a producer for so long, I'm quite, I'd like to think I'm quite good at this point of taking what somebody else has and saying, right, well, this bit doesn't work, how about this? This bit doesn't work, how about this? Yeah. So I was like, you know what? What if I got something to kind of write the lyrics for me, but it doesn't write it for you, it comes up with suggestions. And then yeah. I could go, no, I don't like that because, I don't like that because, let's change it, let's change it. And at the end of it, I ended up with a thing. <laughs> An actual thing. <laughs> An actual thing that I had done. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, any tools like that. I mean, back in the day, you know, all you songwriters used to have like a thesaurus and a rhyming dictionary and <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. So I thought it was pretty cool. So I gave it a try and I quite liked it. But yeah, coming up over the next couple of weeks, like I said, I'm moving house. I don't think there's going to be a podcast next week uh, because it's going to be in the middle of hell. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, aside from the podcast, I've got interviews with Guillaume from Two Notes and Dan Trudeau from Rev Amps, both coming out, and a nice little soapbox rant on game staging. So nice. there's yeah, plenty to be going at. <laughs> <laughs> so how's your week been? Oh, your few weeks? Um, I've not, not seen you on the channel for a while. Uh, busy, just work, lockdown, homeschooling. Oh <laughs> yeah, that just Mm. Not really, not really had much time. Um, I've, I've just downloaded uh, Mammoth. Oh, yeah. Already, but the free version. So I wanted to see what the limitations were. Okay. Kind of thing. So I didn't know there was a free version. Neither did I. <laughs> I was just looking. At it. it was just there. Um, I've been watching a lot of like Scott from Chernobyl's stuff. Yeah. Because he's just done an update for his free guitar tone. So I thought, oh, oh check that out. Okay. No. He he uses um, Ignite a lot, which I thought I I seem to have struggled with Ignite. I don't know why. I just don't seem to get on with it. But yeah, it's a very I specific sound I found on the Ignite. Um, yeah, exactly. But I'm gonna sit with it and kind of try and follow what he's done and kind of see where I was going wrong. Mm. But, other than that, man. Not much musically. Well, yeah, still more than I've done musically this week. I played bass earlier for three and a half minutes while Ivy was demanding, yeah, play that one, play that one. She's more <laughs> interested in the colour of the pick than the instrument. No, no. <laughs> but she is too, so we'll let her off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, shall we jump in it? Yes, let's get on with the news. Yeah. So this was the, the, the title of the, the podcast. This made me smile. Uh yeah if you haven't had not quite enough screen space while you're working on a laptop this could be the answer and i i almost with very little sense of irony actually want one of these i i that does not surprise me one bit Ad. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to follow how this is all folded into itself yeah um i can't quite follow it but the, these two little ones up here just seem to pop out of the tops um, I think you push one down and rotate two in. Oh, hello! It, Actually, it showing my uh, 
screen capture. Let me just. Oh dear. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. It just makes things look all weird. Where where's the? <sighs> there it is. It went up right to the top. So if I do that, it's still there. We go. That's nicer. There we go. That that looks like the equivalent. It's like the music equivalent of those Joe Transformer prams. Yeah. Like you just see mums just kick out perfectly without thinking twice. Yeah. That's the that's the EDM equivalent. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know about that screen and that the the top two little screens there. Oh, they seem a little extra. I'll call but... it. Hmm. I, but I'm just why. <laughs> You know what? You'd when fill I'm, when, every screen. You'd when, fill every screen. I know you would. What? You would fill every single one of those screens. Oh, I would. Um, when I do the live streams with with John Brown, I would love to have this, because like, <laughs> the bottom one would probably be OBS. The top right. one would be the multi view coming straight from the Black Magic switcher. Yep. Uh, one side would probably be the chat window. Um, from so I can keep an eye on the chat. On the other side would be I keep timestamps and I keep copies of questions that people yeah. ask in the chat. And then the top two would probably be to do with like stream health and and stuff like drop frames on one. And I'm not sure what I'd use the last one for, but that's an easy six. <laughs> <laughs> you can have your Chrome and your eBay open on the last one. <laughs> eBay, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I'd probably just have a really big clock on that one join that <laughs> yeah why not because <laughs> yeah that those particular streams that we do with riff hard we're quite kind of conscious on time after an hour we take mm. questions and we go to a break etc sure. etc and having multiple screens at the moment i'm doing it all off one screen in his place and it's a pain in the ass <laughs> excuse me my language if there's any younger one watching yeah it's fine Ooh. <laughs> it's a major pain having to switch between screen and screen and screen and screen sure. even with a stream deck I mean, hell, yeah. I definitely have a stream deck next to this. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. One thing I would Absolutely. say is this is not really a laptop. I would describe this as a portable machine. Your portable brick. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as you categorize it as what it is. It, it's not a laptop. It will never go on your lap. It will, you know, it, it, it's not for that. But yeah, I mean, if I was mixing, I could have Reaper on one of these screens, the mixer window on the next screen. I could have OBS on another screen so I could see you all and the chat window below it. I could have an um, a an A4 standout there of a list of, of uh, requests from the client of, uh, can you change this, less of this, more of this? Yeah. And even then, the top extra little screens could have, I don't even know what I'd put on there, but I'd just put stuff there so i could see it that wasn't flicking between windows and i hate flicking between windows so oh, there no. you go oh so, I mean, how much are we looking at for this that's the this thing is... i don't know these are currently in the prototype phase and on their website okay. i found this which was uh pricing info please email us um uh, due to our current manufacturing processes uh, blah 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 we will be selling our prototypes while they're being developed. Uh, because our solutions are at the prototype stage, prototype purchases will be subject to a contract. Okay. So the contract will probably be, uh, you know this is a prototype, you can't send it back. Yeah. Uh, the, it's an NDA, so you're not telling people what you paid for it. Sure. And, yeah, it'll be like, look, this isn't a normal sale. Yeah, it it will be, like you said, it'll be a lot of NDA, can't post of reviews or anything like that until they say so. Yeah. Obviously, with it being a prototype, they probably wouldn't be happy with that either way. No. I mean, actually, yeah, Al jokes this would be great for the Twitch addict. But, like, if, if, you, <laughs> if you were a streamer and you changed location a lot, and I know a lot of streamers, yeah. they go to tournaments and that kind of thing, so they do change location a lot. This could, I mean, it looks stupid uh, for your average person, but if I was a, a high-level gamer and this had like a 1390 or something crammed in it, yeah, then you could do high-level gaming whilst Twitch streaming on the same machine without it breaking a sweat. Hmm. 
I mean, it, it'd have to be something like a 30-90 in the final version. It's got to have to be that level just to try and keep up and run that. Because yeah, I think it depends what you're doing on it. I mean, a 3060 would be more than capable of driving all those screens if you're not doing intense 3D. Yeah, um, but, but if you are, then yeah, good luck to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I, mean, I don't think you've got to be doing casual work on that. No, you're really not. Although, having said that, it looks like um, those two, like I said, those two side screens kind of rotate yeah, they like in. Yeah, fold down. Yeah. yeah, so you could probably still use this with a single screen or two screens if you were actually on the go. Uh, and then when you yeah, know you're in... When you know you're in like a place where you're not going to move, you just go, yeah, transform <laughs> it to the ultra beast. I still think it's really funny that they've got all of this going on, and still the mouse is on a piece of paper for a trackpad. Go cut corners somewhere. Absolutely. Go cut corners. <laughs> yeah, if you can, if you need to save money because you spent all your money on these things, oh boy. But yeah, I just thought it was so funny. So there you go. Not only funny, but like if that was twelve grand or something, I know people who would pay that. Yeah, that's the worrying thing. Mm. <laughs> if I had twelve grand, I'd pay it. That's silly. I, that exactly. That's who I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. So next thing, Ableton Live is coming in twelve days, February twenty third, and cool. you can try it now. Okay. So yeah, it's in public beta. Uh, mm. So apparently the public beta is free if you sign up for it. I'm guessing it'll stop working after the full version comes out, though. Yeah. Was that a touch screen next to the keyboard? Says Marty. I don't know. Uh, it didn't say in the article. Sorry, but yes, um, Ableton 11. That is a ridiculously tiny screen to run Ableton on, which actually tracks for the user base. And, and we've just seen seven screens. Of course, that's going to look small. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but even so, look at it. It looks silly. That that looks like one of the, is it the, the Air Max. Inch. Yeah, something like that. But, um, Some completely random mixer down in the corner. It's like, yeah. yeah there's, there's an RME there's just... interface, full rack unit there. We don't need a mixer. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> but there oh, you go. Yeah, so, oh, have you have you used Ableton much? Uh, not in the last few years. I used it a fair bit when it was Live 7 and 8. Um, yeah. It just never quite worked for the kind of music I was working with. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't have many bad things to say about Ableton, It, but it is very genre-specific, I find. I've always found that for electronic guys, it does a thing if you're working in loops, if you're working in set bars. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there is an alternative view in Ableton that's more of like a track view that's like a whole song view, but my way that I work, that would be the number one priority and everything would revolve around that rather than the other way around. So, sure. yeah, but it does Ooh. some cool stuff. Um, apparently yeah. it now comes with comping, uh, linked track editing. So yeah, things like, yeah, um, proper vocal comping and that kind of thing is now something you can do in there, but that's something okay. I've needed for ever. So that's mm. what I mean. The work, the kind of work I was working on, it would have been like ice skating uphill. It, yeah. It could do it, but you're really, really fighting it to get it to do what you wanted. But yeah, um, apparently if you pre-order it, nobody should ever pre-order anything, but this is software, <laughs> so it might be okay. 20% uh, discount if you do that. And yeah, that only lasts until the release day. So okay, uh, so that on April twenty third, that's gone. Uh, February twenty third. February twenty. But yes, yeah, on February twenty third, if you want to buy it, you pay full price because you didn't pre order it. Mm. But yeah, the intro version seventy nine euros, standard versions three four nine, and the Ableton Suite is five ninety nine, which includes all of their like sample libraries and synths and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it's yeah. not it's not too bad. Hmm. Because I, I I was looking at using Ableton Live not too long ago uh, to work with some industrial guys, mm. uh, kind of in um. A live perspective 
and how to handle that. So it'd be section per section, kind of like you said, with the samples ready. Yeah. And then maybe one or two live instruments. Mm. But um, yeah, I never got dive down into it. I know you always get a, like a free copy of live light with like um, a call keyboard or something like that. You always tend to get a version there. Yeah, it is very common. It's one of the ways that they've managed to, you know, pol- proliferate and get mm-hmm. to, like massive industry wide acceptance. I think is to just make sure everybody who starts out has a copy, so they're all talking about yeah. it. And yeah, uh, yeah. There's people in chat saying Ableton's user friendly, and people disagreeing. Um, I think it's very user friendly if you work the way it wants you to work. If your mind works in the way that Ableton likes and if you are looking at loop-based stuff and kind of being very sectional, then yeah, it's very user-friendly. And the inserts and plugins and that kind of thing, the way they work, is actually quite nice because it's very easy to see on screen if you're using all the inbuilt plugins. It it, it, it lays itself out in a very easy-to-see way. So yeah, there are very good things about it. Yeah, I, to be honest, I think this goes back to most doors. You find one that fits you. Yes. I think. Yeah, you kind of settle on it. Um, yeah. um, one of my friends uh, has moved from Logic to Reaper. Right. And he's kind of gone, oh, okay, this is actually a lot more flexible. Yes. But composition wise, he likes Logic. So it's all, de- like you said, it all depends on how you're approaching it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that that's a very good arg- uh, argument for a lot of them. Like some workstation software, it's a little bit more like you're bowling and someone's put the rails up, yeah. which if you just don't care and you just want to get results, get results yeah. now, fine, great. Yeah, absolutely. Reaper's kind of the other way where all bets are off, all help is gone. All Yeah. But if you're like me and you say, well, today for this project, I want to do it this weird ass way. Reaper yeah. goes, yeah, right. But it's like, yeah. if you want to do it straight down the line, you can, but then you want to do it a completely different way the next day. So like, yeah. Okay. But something like Ableton's like, no, you do it this way. Yeah. And then you say, but, I, but hang on. No. And it goes, no, you, but that's, that's the same with logic for me is it's like, no, you, you'll do it this way. Yeah. I, I found that it's quite interesting. You mentioned that because I'm just going through the slate masterclass. Oh, yeah. And Joe, they have the template folders, the Kane, Chukro, uh, Melmix one. Yeah. I'm yeah. particularly looking at. And you download that Reaper project and you go, oh, oh, this is how you're laying it out. Like, yeah. Um, I, it was one of the vocal mix ones I was looking at, and it was like 14 layers of vocals. Okay. Not grouped, not, set, not split, not color coded. I was like, what? But again, that's just my mindset. I like mm. to group everything so i know what things are yeah and for I me, it's folders like, for everything yeah yeah so you end up with like five phases at the end <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean but then there's also things in reaper that i would very rarely use that sometimes just come in handy like um mm. one of them for this celestian project one that came to mind this week is vcas if you know what vcas oh, yeah. are vcas yeah, yeah. are kind of an old school way of doing like volume control but not yeah. necessarily on a group, just on channels that you nominate. Mm. So what I thought okay. was, like, I've got 25 different folders for each speaker because I'm doing it like two close mics and uh, two room mics. Uh, so that, that's the way I'm doing it. Certain amps, I'm going to want more room sound. Certain amps, I'm going to want less room sound. Yeah. If I have to go and do that control on every single group, that's going to drive me insane. <laughs> so, no, I get that. But if I have a VCA separately and just assign it to the room mics in every folder and say, okay, at this point, just turn down the room mics a bit. In every folder, it'll just do it. Yeah. I very rarely would use that fun- functionality because usually for me, folders do that job. Hmm. But this is one of those rare times where I can control 25 or is it 50, 50 faders with just one fader without having to yeah. go in, without having to go into folders and screw around individually. Mm. See, um, I used it one that I don't really do is like side gating and stuff like that. Mm. I don't 
it's not something I'm big into. I don't know why. It's just I never did. But I was um, side gating um, a vocal with okay. a, another vocal. Right. I think I, I send you. So it was a just the main like death metal vocal. Yeah. And then there was a really low guttural one. Mm. But that was just a solid note. So what I did, I triggered it from the main vocal. Right. As just like a another way of doubling the vocal, but because it's inaudible in one sense, it was just there to add that bit of gruff and low end. Oh yeah, so it came up with the main vocal. Yeah, yeah. So it sounded like there was a backing vocal just doing this stupid guttural kind of thing mm-hmm. underneath what was going on. Right. But because it was just a, because it was never double tracked or yeah. anything like that. Mm. It was just a way to add a, a backing vocal without doing it. <laughs> Hmm. There's yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's that's where yeah, we're getting off track from that. But that's that's where Reaper's really good yeah, for me. Sorry. It's like <laughs> I want to do this crazy weird thing, and it just goes yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um. Hello, Mage. Mel- welcome, 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 everybody to the chat. You're always hi, welcome. everyone. <laughs> so yeah, from that to talking about brutal metal, uh, the new Epiphone Brendan Small Ghost Horse. Which I Whoa. I misread earlier is the Brendan small ghost horse. <laughs> it's thought, a small scale. <laughs> yeah, it's the ghost pony, <laughs> which is a really pretty looking uh, explorer. Um, With a Floyd, yeah. twenty four okay. fret Floyd explorer in a pretty grey. Oh. Very unusual for for Gibson. Yeah, but Brendan well, yeah. Small uh, from Death Clock Metalocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, and his other band whose name I can never remember. Uh, Galacticon, there we go. Uh, okay. Yeah, he's already had two uh, Gibson Signature models. This is the third Has one. He? So, yeah. The uh, the Snow Falcon and the Thunder Horse. I wonder if they were both Epiphone uh, yeah. models. But, yeah. Um, yeah, this comes with the Gibson USA... Oh, excuse me for the hiccups there. That's the Guinness talking. Um, the Gibson USA Burst Booker 1 and 2. So, yeah, decent, well-made pickups in the yeah. Epiphone. It's a Floyd Rose... Uh, oh, yeah, now I've got the hiccups. Um, that was the there FRT 1000 <laughs> Tremolo, so it's not what I would call the original okay. Floyd. It's the, the Floyd no, no, 1000, no. so it's like... Knockoff's the wrong word, but it's kind of made less solidly than the proper sure. heavy Floyd. But for seven hundred and ninety nine dollars for that, it's, it's not a bad price that's at, not all. Bad at all. And the, I, whole, the whole thing's bound. Twenty four fret mean, on that Explorer mm. is pretty different. And I, I mean, un- I unless mean, you've I got, think we've seen we've yeah. seen Floyd's on them. Before, I think we have so... maybe. But yeah, unless you've got fingers that are like a foot long to reach that twenty fourth <laughs> fret because of the access there. I can't see it yeah. making much difference to most people, but maybe if you tap with your right hand, you could on the, the 23rd and 4th frets there, but Why if not? you want to do that, you do it, you know. <laughs> it's very pretty. It's mm. a very pretty top as well, and the price isn't bad at all for that. Yes. Uh, do we know what scale this figures out to be or anything like that? Uh, let's have a look. Um don't see any detail on scale length, but it is a, okay. a Gibson, so I'm going to assume it's a 24.75. Yeah. Which, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. That's the same as the Dean scale. Yeah. I mean, Dimebag loved that, so... Not exactly. Yeah. You, can, you can make anything work. I mean, yeah, he's... Mm. You go back to Great Summon Tranquil and stuff like that, and he was tuned so low. He, he wasn't using baritone or anything like that. No. He was and just I using think, thick strings and flopping them around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it kind of added to it. I mean, I've done drop G sharp on a Les Paul before, so yes, it can be done. It was stupid, but it can be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that thing went boing when you hit it. It was funny. It's great. <laughs> but yeah, from the pretty guitar to the strange but pretty pedal. Uh, this struck Wait. me as something a little bit weird. Um, could be useful. This was the split meld from Old Blood Noise Endeavors. Uh, okay. It's a passive uh, box that is non-stru- non-summing, non-destructive. Way to 
both parallel dual mono and stereo signal paths. Uh, mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, looking at it, if I remember rightly, um, yeah, so these go together to be a TRS uh, jack, but these yeah. two left and right are actually TS jacks. So you can combine two mono signals into a stereo cable. Right. Yes. And the other way around, you can take a stereo cable. And you can yeah. use you can use both the same way or you can use them different ways. So if you've got a pedal that does stereo but only on TRS, which I know that some pedals, smaller pedals can do stereo, but they don't have four jacks on. Sure. Then you can make that work with one of these. I mean, yes, you can do that with cables as well, but this looks like a much more neat it's, solution. It's, yeah, it's a neatier, mm. a neat, prettier way of doing it. And oh. considering these are twenty nine dollars for one of these, this is probably the uh, the solution you'd use. I mean, that's not a lot of money for a small. Pedal, no, you know. I, I was thinking, Joe. You know, we see it a lot with these kind of weirdy, weirdy, weirdy boutique pedals yeah. that the price is kind of jacked up to hell. Yeah, but. But twenty nine dollars, it's probably like you said, it's probably easier in the long run. Are yeah. you gonna use it a crazy amount? I don't know, but for twenty nine dollars, it's not a big deal. It is passive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's completely passive. Doesn't no, need power, it, so it's yeah, not gonna so make not, your life any more complicated. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's there for the sake of it, kind of. Yeah, but actually, like if you've got any pedals, they've got either a TRS in or a TRS out. This could be the thing you need that unlocks some cool new features. Like if you've got a delay, like I know that some of the Meris Audio pedals have got TRS for stereo output. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, yeah, you use one of these, and suddenly you can send the two separate, completely just jack standard guitar jacks out mm. to separate pedals or separate amps or whatever it is you want yeah. to do that suddenly gets a bit clever with it. Or, yeah, if you've got... Yeah, so if you've got a stereo delay and you want to send two signals into it, they now go separately to left and right. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, yeah. you can use it as simple as going to two amps with one, with one board. Yeah. Yeah, if you had... It could be used for something as simple as that, really. Mm. Um, Oh, you can like you said, you can get crazy with this. Yeah, it's, but so. yeah, there's there's quite a few options there. I thought that was a pretty yeah. clever thing to talk about. So, yeah. moving on, have you seen this? The most brutal guitar ever. So, yeah, the, there's a, a guy who's made this guy's made his uncle's skeleton into a guitar. How uh, how metal. No. Did no one in this family go, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> well, from from what I gather, um, yeah, his, his uncle, that's the uncle on the left. So the uncle was actually like a metal player. Uh, uh, oh, right. So, uh, f this, so this uncle, Philip, died young in a car accident 20 odd years ago. Uh, when he was still alive, he asked for his bones to be donated for medical study at a local college. Uh, apparently, the college had no use for them, so they were returned to the family. Uh, the, so they were Greek Orthodox, and cremation is forbidden. Right, so, okay. Yeah, it was just an interesting thing of like, yeah. How 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 does this conversation come up? You know, you're going through the attic, you clear it out and go, what's this? Oh, it's my uncle. I know what to do with that. Turn him it, into it a metal guitar. It is the most brutal death metal thing at all, but... Oh, there there we go. Oh, oh no. Oh. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. Is it? Is it really, though? <laughs> I mean... Are you sure? <gasps> that is like George says in chat. That's real death metal right there. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you that. Just how how does it sound? I Do we have, have a sound clip of this. Uh, let's see if I can. Let's see if it will play. I... No, I'm not getting anything on my side. I don't know if the stream is, but 
They should be able to hear it. It sounds pretty bad. Yeah, this guy's obviously better at building guitars than playing guitars. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's creative, it, definitely, but... Yeah, that's all I got. I, I can't. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's a yeah. single coil. It's a single coil as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, brutal. Uh, that was just something a l just a little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, you got that right. <laughs> Classic Florida man antics. Right yeah. there. Florida <laughs> man <laughs> makes uncle into guitar. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. But yeah, there you go. That was that was a, today's and finally weird article. Ah, so let's, we go. let's talk about something a bit more normal. Something yes. that also doesn't have a head. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Strandberg have announced <laughs> new Pliny and Pierre Nilsson signature models. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just carry on. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, as if nothing happened. Yeah. And even before anyone says anything, I'm betting the middle one's the Pliny model and the outer two are both Pierre Nilsson models. You are 100% correct. So we have seen the one on the right, the Pierre Nilsson 8. Okay. Through his time with Meshuggah. Right. He's been, that's one of the prototypes he's been using. So I think it's going to be a Lundgren M8 in that. Okay. I know uh, the Pliny one, he, he's had a signature before, but it wasn't neck through. I think that's the big thing with this. Yes, it, to... it is a neck through. Yeah. Yeah. Which and surprises he's... me with that it wasn't before because these are so small that it's just like it didn't seem like it should be that much more effort to make it a neck through. No, it, it is um, a bit of a weird one because, yeah, most Strombergs are bolt on by standards. Right, okay. I believe. I could be that, I could be completely misquoted, uh, but I think the majority of them are bolt on, the standard series. Mm. I have to ask, uh, there's one, one, one of my uh, friends from this year from Gear Street, a guy called Jack Gardner. He's a Strandberg artist. Oh, I will cool. I will ask him. But yeah, he plays some very, very cool ergonomic diddly 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 stuff. Uh <laughs> you, ne Neo Soul they call it. Yourself. What? Have you tried a Strandberg yourself yet? I have. I've tried Jack's one with the trapezoid neck and everything, and it's it's different. It makes you play very differently, which is weird. Yeah. You yeah. just naturally play in seven eights and uh, Mixolydian. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's quite it, pretty. Mm. Mm. Not sure I'd want the trem though, but that's just me personally. Yeah. Cha chambered swamp ash, solid maple top, Australian yeah. black wood veneer, and three thousand US dollars. Oh, okay. Oof. Yeah, but then the, these yeah. are the ones that are all handmade in yes. is it Sweden. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sweden. Yeah. And these are the uh, the singularity true temperament, which somehow yeah. they've managed to cram three pickups into that that tiny little space there. That that's impressive in itself. Yeah, to be fair. and th this um, one has these or these two because there's also the blue blast eight string. Yeah, yeah, these two are multi scale true temperament. Uh, so it's hard tail, of course, because it's all uh, tuned from the back there, mm. and. Yeah, fixed bridge, which makes more sense to me. I'm not usually one for using a wiggle stick, but you know, if you yeah, want to, same. you can. Is it? Um, I know Strandberg is a very polarizing, mm. but, but I think that's the way with most ergonomic style guitars now. Yes, it's, of of which, of course, Strandberg are pretty much the kings of the ergonomic guitar. Yeah, especially at the moment, it's they are riding such a good ride at the moment, and mm. you know. True temperament and all that kind of stuff. It's it. it this isn't just a casual thing. No, no. The, these yeah. are yeah. Well, at the price, they're definitely not casual. These are thirty seven hundred and thirty eight hundred US dollars, respectively. That's that's not as bad as I expected. Just because a true temperament can be very expensive, there's only it can one yeah. 
one or two companies that do it really so yeah but i suppose with this kind of thing if if they if they know they're doing a set number run mm. then they can factor it into the price sure, which is why course, between yeah. the seven and eight string there's only a hundred dollar difference yeah. uh probably to do with the one extra you know one yeah. extra tuning pin you know because it costs them a certain amount to make these bespoke instruments anyway I would imagine sure. a lot of the time taken and the amount of staff cost to get this done properly is the large part of the expense here. Yeah. Uh, they're saying um, about the price and stuff like that, but you, know, you look at the Lundgrens and they're not cheap pickups either. No, they're not. You know? They're handmade. And, yeah, and a calibrated set of them. It's Yeah, it soon adds up. Mm. And this isn't going to be your standard... Rosewood or basswood kind of thing. This is no. This is all done properly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Aluminium uh, hardware. I mean, a lot of people have bad things to say about basswood as well. But I think that's what a lot of people don't understand with with basswood is there's cheap basswood and then there's really good basswood, like mm. there is with any wood. You can get really cheap mahogany. Yeah, exactly. And um, you can get really really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Ben's just asked what true temperament is. So. Every fret and every string will have will technically kind of be out of tune when you put pressure on it because you are bending the string. True temperament pretty much compensates for that whole variance. So you'll see just a little bit on the like uh, G and B where it kind of bends in, and that's kind of to do with the material of the string. And yeah, so you can kind of see how they're all a bit wibbly wobbly. But yeah. it's to ensure that it is a perfect note in every instance kind of thing. Yeah, I've it's one people... of those things. With, with even really good vintage guitars, you play an open E and it sounds in tune. You play the F and it sounds slightly out. That's yeah. not the guitar's fault. That's the way that physics works. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of compensated. You see, um, is it Misha that has one with an Evertune as well? Yes. So a true temper mayonnaise with an ever tune it's pretty much every note is in key no matter what kind yeah, of thing exactly because yeah like I, if, if one string at a certain point is going to be sharp you pull the fret back a little bit so that when it's fretted it is right it's yeah. weird but you uh, you get used to it i played a true temperament while i was at henning's place oh, and okay. you don't even notice because you're not supposed to be playing on the frets anyway you're supposed to be playing mm. b between the frets mm. so you just don't notice it looks like you would but then it's the same with multi-scale it looks like you would notice but you you play for a little while even a little yeah. while and you don't notice at all yeah exactly it, it, even when you see joe these joe a ding walls joe 37 to 34 that's quite a distance yeah but after a while it's not that big a deal just because of the natural shape of how your hand will move across the neck yeah and so, a lot of that with multi-scale depends on how much of the scale they put at the, the picking hand. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, the way that multi-scale works is you can decide where the kind of the middle point is. Yeah. And, 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 then, yeah. and all these uh, brands do generally different kind of where the center point of the fan is. Yeah. So we'll do five, seven, some 12. You know, you'll find people that do everything and anything. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's it, quite interesting in itself, the whole multi-scale thing. But all in all, I like Strandbergs, so I can't say anything. Hmm. Uh, I, and I'm a big Per Nielsen fan, so I'm yes. quite happy. I, I do like Per Nielsen stuff. It's only a couple of weeks ago, me and John Brown were stood in front of his computer watching a Per Nielsen video, and we both just stood there going, ah. Have you seen, it, I think it was not last year, but the year before, Nam, where he's playing um, uh, at Fortin, the Evil Pumpkin amp. Oh, yeah, yeah, And there's a crowd that just shouts different keys at him. <laughs> and he just instantly starts playing it. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he's a bit good. Yeah, he's on a different planet. It's yeah. just bizarre. Mm. So from super modern to super vintage. Rickenbackers celebrate 90 years with new models. What's weird about these? That's flipped. Yes. Wait, what? 
Yeah, so stare a little bit harder. The one on the left is a Rickenbacker yeah. 408, which is a guitar, when usually that's the bass shape. Yeah, that's the bass shape. And the one on the, the, one right, on the right is, is a bass, which is usually the guitar shape. It's usually the 360 shape. Uh, let's see what they've called that. They've called that the 4005XC, uh, okay, which now. is a bit of a weird one. Now, the guitar makes more sense. Um, if you know about Rickenbacker history, and I'm quite a fan of Rickenbackers back in the day, uh, they made guitars like this all the way up to 1984. They just weren't crazy popular. Um, if you ever seen Kasabian, uh, Serge from Kasabian's played one of these for years yeah. and years. Uh, but yeah, they've come out with this limited edition, uh, which is £3,600. So we're looking at four and a half thousand dollars dollars $5,000. Um it's it's the ultimate Rickenbacker finish as well. It's the tobacco burst with the checkerboard <laughs> binding. That is the ultimate. So I imagine a lot of people will pay for that. And then, yeah, this is the one that messes with my head a little bit because it's like the old <laughs> Rickenbacker kind of 360 type model. Yeah, yeah. It, it's only a 30.5 scale length, though. Okay. So it's it's very vintage kind of like gibson eb zero type it's going to be very thumpy thumpy because yeah. that's that's the thing that i've always found about short scale bases is they give a definite thump 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 kind of thing yeah. but yeah there you go a little bit weird and those are uh how much more three eight 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 so nearly four thousand pounds i i don't get the price i don't i might but, be missing something else but i think what well, all Every Rickenbacker is handmade in the US for a start. They don't have a factory in like Korea, China, Japan, anywhere. They just, yeah. they don't. They, if you have a Rickenbacker, it is made in the US. So that's the first thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing is they don't have to care. They can price things however they like. Um, was it last year or the year before? I met the CEO of Rickenbacker. Uh, yeah, there was like a, a UK meet going on. So me and my dad went down and we, we, we met him. And he said, I was in the crowd and I said, well, why don't you make stuff that's still kind of that way, but appeals a bit more to modern players? And he said, long story short, we don't have to. We have a three year wait list. Really? Three years? Yeah, three year wait list. And it's like, well, why would we, why would we do something that we don't know if it's going to sell when what we do do, we're yeah. not worried about, you know, it's like. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Now I get that. So, yeah, that's the thing. If you want a Rickenbacker that's not off the production line, there's a three-year wait. <laughs> wow. So, didn't yeah. Realize. No, I didn't. And it's like, well, fair enough. If you've got your business model sewn up. Because, I mean, then you could oh, say, yeah. well, why don't they expand? It's like, well, if they expand, then they catch up with the demand. Then they've got to start doing stuff to try and fill yeah. that extra you know, capacity. And that's what's been the ruin of a lot of companies over the years. Well, yeah. When they're trying to do so many you know, things that they're not used to or they're not good at yeah. or then they cheap out or whatever, eee, that way there'd yeah. be dragons. They may as well stick with their you know, integrity and just do what they yeah. do, I guess. Well, yeah. if you can, why not? Yeah. Last year, I nearly bought myself a five-string Rickenbacker. They made a five-string model for a while. Did they? Yeah. And it had these kind of weird wedge-shaped pickups, which is the reason why I didn't buy it in the end. It didn't look right. Yeah. Fair um, enough. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, so from that to some plugins. Uh, Trident have turned their 1966 and 80B hardware equalizers into plugins. So let's cool. see, Trident Digital Edition series. The ATB is one of the most famous uh, Trident EQs. I know that for sure. Um, mm. Some of my friends over at Foal Studios in Wales have got a Trident ATB desk. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, the Trident desk is like their pride and joy. The, the Trident desk is, you know, they're so British sounding, it's ridiculous. Uh, very smooth. Um introductory prices okay so trident audio developments they are their own company oh okay and yeah huh. currently uh the atb costs 60 dollars, and the other one costs 80 dollars right now which isn't unreasonable for a plugin but still that's a lot of money for an eq plugin it better sound damn good yeah for that. Um, yeah that it's 
it's getting on a bit for yeah and it, i'm not saying it's an untested company because they definitely have the history but yeah digitally they are an untested yeah yeah exactly it's kind of started from scratch with a lot of people i i'd feel yeah now it's so. entirely possible that they've got some sort of well-established plug-in designers behind it but if they have let's oh, hear yeah. it tell us about yeah. it you know yeah tell us who's doing it then i mean look at um Bolton. you know we're using neuro dsp and yes. neuro and, and you know they pushed neuro a lot mm. It's like, did. well, and I think Trident kind of needs to give us a bit more background in regards to how these came about, other than saying, well, it's old stuff that we, we used in the 70s and we just made it digital. Mm. No, let's, let's, a bit of a behind the scenes, I think, would help a lot, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly would. So hopefully we'll get to see that in future. Yeah. Uh, now, Hughes and Kettner, this caught my eye because they're kind of. Not under new management, but they have a whole new staff recently. Uh, oh, okay. They've made this, which made my eye go, hmm, which is uh, the, uh, the Amp Man, classic and modern. This seems like their take on the blue guitar, you know, the Thomas Blug amp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is a 50 watt instead of a 100 watt from the Thomas Blug, and it's an amp in a box, so there's like the modern sound and there's the classic sound. And okay. yeah, it's got the Spirit Tone Generator. I've got the Black Spirit 200 in the studio, and it actually sounds really good. Yeah. But with only 50 solid-state watts, I'm not sure if that'll be loud enough for a lot of applications. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. It's... We'll have to see, because, yeah, solid-state 50-watt amps can be designed to be pretty loud, or they can be not loud. Yeah. Part of that's to do with the actual cab you plug it into as well. If you plug that into a 16-ohm cab with low-sensitivity speakers, you're not going to get much out of it. If you plug it into a 4-ohm yeah. cab with really high-sensitivity speakers, you might be able to deafen a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> but it looks like these, they're only €350 Euros each, and that is an amp in a pedal, so you don't actually it's need to... Bad. Yeah, you don't need to buy a separate amp, which is clever. And they'll be available 10 days from now, 21st of February. Oh, cool. So, yeah, they weren't an AM announcement, but there they are. No. Mm, so, it's got the the red box AE+, plus, whatever that means. There's a new version of the the red box. I wonder if you could it, load an impulse response in there, because you can on some of the new Hughes and yeah. stuff. I, it, I do like how it's still kind of set up as a pedal. Jody's like, kickable boost. Yes. And stuff like that. It's a, rather than just, like, no, it's just an amp on the floor. It mm. actually still kind of feels like a pedal at the same time. Yeah, so you could use it on your board. The only concern I would have with that is that there's no guard in between the knobs no, that's and good. where you that's feet That's a very kick. good point. Yeah, so either you're going to end up kicking the knobs off or, best case scenario, you're going to move something with your foot. Mm. But yeah, they do sound really good. I've you like I said, I've got the Black Spirit, and the the sagging control is actually a lot more powerful than people would think. Yeah, uh, the sag control is like you turn that up, it gets a bit quieter, so you bump the volume to match, and you get a kind of a squishy, thick, what sounds okay. like really heavily driven classic amp. All right. And you turn the sagging most of the way back, and you start to get like. Uh, dual rectifier-ish tones, then 5150-ish tones, then Marshall-ish yeah. tones, then really stiff, like, industrial tones. Yeah. And, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a really powerful kind of knob, even though you don't have the full bass, middle, treble, that kind of thing. There's a there's a lot of control there, more than you would think. Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. So cool. there you go. There's, there's a lot to be playing with. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Then uh, we've got the Orbiter. This is weird. Uh, this is um. multi-sensory <laughs> turntable sequencer. What on earth right. is this? Apparently because they're ma these things are magnetic, you don't have to have it like a, a sure, sure. vinyl turntable, but you can. And apparently, it's, yeah, it's a sequencer, so when things go underneath this bar, they, they then... So it Trig triggers it from that. Yeah, yeah, it triggers them from that. And I think between the colours and where you put them, 
you can get different sequences and different different Melodies patterns and all sorts. sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in a very physical way, which I thought was kind of yeah. cool. Uh, there are 12 colours to represent 12 notes. Ah, okay. Which are passed, okay. passed to an app that sees MIDI notes. Okay. And the distance from the centre can be used to represent different tracks or different MIDI messages. Right, okay. Yeah. So by different MIDI messages, maybe it could be like filter, like, you know, yeah. like how open sure the does. filter is, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. There's three right. different modes. Yeah. This, this seems like a massive, massive setup that could be potentially powerful. Yeah. yeah. But, it so seems this, like something that's really silly until you dig into it and suddenly it's not. Yeah. It. I. My only thing is what. Okay. It looks like you can decide the RPM it um, spins at on the side. Uh. Yes. So there's like yeah. Plus minus. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Wait. It that's it seems interesting. Mm. Maybe, I don't know if gimmicky or not. I can't. I can't actually decide with this. I can imagine someone like Dead Mouse actually using this in a song. Yeah, because that's that's the kind of thing he does. <laughs> yeah, like a live kind of moving things around. It, it could be arty, I suppose, but. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, like off the grid IDM or e even EDM. Uh, apparently, yeah. there's a little daughter board where you can have four channels with uh, CV and gate triggers, so you can plug it straight into like a modular synth and have oh, it cool. have it have each one of those four channels separately trigger. Yeah, modular synth. That That's cool. really clever. Mm. But yeah, fun and colorful. Apparently, they did a presentation at NAM, but. That, sure. yeah. There you go. There you, uh, and finally, it's time for Behringer Corner. There we go. So a few hey. weeks ago, we talked about their new versions of the ARP twenty six hundred, which they call yep. the Blue Marvin and the Grey Mini. Which the actual blue and grey twenty six hundreds were like the early release models, and it sounded slightly yeah. different to each other. Um, but. Yeah, the reason that these have been brought up again is that it's now time for pre-orders. Oh. So, yeah, if you want one of these, the price is out, the ordering's out, you can get them from Toman. Uh, they're out of stock until March, so that, obviously that wow. means that's when they're released. That didn't take long. Uh, well, they've been working on these for a while, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah, um, so you'll pre-order them to be ready in March. They're €620 Euros each. Which, if you think how much a real 2600 cost on release, it was probably twice that in $1970. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, thousands on that's thousands not on a bad thousands. price, really. Yeah. For what that's it is. not bad at all. I mean, of course, yeah. it's the whole Shady Behringer, not great with other companies thing. I know they've got a bad reputation. But yeah. if you want a, a 2600 and you don't want to pay lots of money, there, there, there's your option, you know. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, there yeah. we go. Uh, that's our Behringer Corner. Go and buy one if you were ever, if you were going to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of the news. Uh, now, do we have any questions in chat? Because yeah, it's um, now's now's the right time to get those questions in. And I've got to start packing up. Um, yeah, I got. I still got to go shopping yet. Yeah. <laughs> I got a t-shirt in the mail earlier, which I was not expecting from uh, Audient, which is cool. Hey. hey. And it says, uh, you can't unhear quality. I like <laughs> which that. Which just re reminds me of the future armor. Um, You've seen it. You can't unsee it. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I'm, as I'm unpacking the house, um, like I've got this uh, podcast pro from Sontronics, yeah. which is great. And I've got the ID4 Mark II, which, because I've got the ID14 Mark II, I'm never going to use the ID4 Mark II again, uh, because okay. I have the next step up, you know. Yeah. Um, I can't physically use them both at the same time. So, I'm not saying that as a flex, I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> um, so, I am... Oh, I've been called out. Uh, Nick is actually doing the homeschooling. I am... 
um, monitoring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, no, she's been uh, doing that and work and having been. It's crazy. But she's done amazing. So there we go. Yeah. So, um, well, what we got? so yeah, those things. Uh, so I was going somewhere with it. And also the Lewitt 440, which the uh, review is still upcoming for that, but we're due yeah. very soon. Um, there's an there's a, a young artist called Erin Snape who I heard a demo from recently, which I was just floored by. Uh, she was highlighted by Adam Neely. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I was like, right, yeah, okay. So I ended up talking to her, and she does a lot of her stuff from home and doesn't have really good recording gear. So I was like, right, you need some gear. You are really <laughs> good. Here is some gear. Awesome. So, yeah, she's going to be the last piece of the puzzle for the Lewitt 440 demo video. Because uh, really? I needed, well, I needed an acoustic guitarist and a singer who isn't me. And because of lockdown, that's been difficult. And yeah. so I thought, you know what? Two birds, one stone. Here's some stuff. Here's a leg up. Yeah. And in return, you, you, you know, you do that last bit for this video. And yeah. there you go. I think mean, that's fair. Yeah, also then she doesn't have to feel bad about being given stuff for free. It's kind of, it's a thing. She gets to be on a video for a thing. And exactly. I get to help young talent, which is great. Exactly. So, yeah, there you go. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, question. Uh, you mentioned the Trident has the British sound. How is it different from the Neve sound? Uh, that is very difficult mm. to describe with words. Um, the British EQ sound is usually very broad, musical, yeah. and sweet, whereas the American sound with like the API desks is very peaky and very aggressive. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, uh, the American sounds very sharp, almost. It's, yeah, if, if you I, turn up the mids on an API EQ, you know about it straight away. Yeah, it's exactly. like, um, In fact, API desks, they click on the EQ every 2 dB. So there's no fine control. It's like, yeah, more or less, click, click, click. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think, compared to the British, it's a lot looser. Uh, well, looser mm. sounds the wrong way to say it. It's not as vocal. Ugh. Again, it's, not, it's trying to find the right yeah. way. It just sounds British. <laughs> it's the only way yeah, to say it. The, the only way I can describe it is is go and find some YouTube videos that talk about it and give audio examples and then compare and yeah. contrast. Because that's, that's... There is a difference and we can give a name to it, but without you actually hearing it, it's very difficult to just just say that's why in the uh, the pro mix academy course that i did there was a whole there was a whole like three hour long eq section i actually pull different types of eq out on a source and start playing with them and go you hear this difference you hear that difference the, you know and start talking about them in context because context is so important and that's why i like doing these live mix streams that i do every you know whenever i can because yeah. you can actually see what I'm doing as I talk about it and hear it. Because mm. without that context, I find that you can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And in a lot of circumstances, it doesn't help. Yeah. And I always feel there's key things that are always missed with stuff like that. Yeah. Like, they'll they'll tell you so much. Oh, I use this and this and this. But what did you actually do? I thought uh, the track you and I did together where you did the full live stream of basically starting from DIs to oh, yeah. the full thing. You can follow every single step and how we got that sound and how the bass played a massive part in it and how the drums had to be adjusted. And yeah, it, I, I think it was more fascinating seeing that rather than going, hey, this is a review of this. This is how it sounds. Bye. You know, yeah. It doesn't give you that journey, if that no, makes sense. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean that's why I've got this this review on the Rev generator coming. That's taken yeah. a while to do because I'm trying to take a bit of that approach and trying to get as many audio examples in there as possible and yeah. trying to give as much context as I can, which of course again in a national lockdown is difficult, but so it's oh, not yeah. just 20 minutes of me going, it's good, it changes color, it's got distortion. <laughs> it's like, yeah, could have seen that in the brochure. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yo, we watched a trailer on YouTube for that. But exactly, yeah. But I'll actually do it. 
Mm. There you go. So, yeah. Uh, um, no, I don't think we're getting many questions. It's um, funny, they'll all come in after we... Uh, I know, as soon as we say we're going. <laughs> yeah, because that's what always happens is, it's like, hi guys, sorry I'm late, I've got a question, ah, uh, bye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can't oh, be helped. No. But yeah, uh, hopefully uh, the next podcast will be two weeks today. Um, as far as I know, I'm getting internet installed in the new house pretty much straight away. Uh, but yeah, this time next week, I'm going to have a giant van and be physically <laughs> lifting most of the, the house. So, yeah, pretty sure that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, you never know. You never know. No, but considering... Well, just no. <laughs> yeah, just no. Um, hopefully this weekend I'll get to be in the studio at least for a brief period to play with my new toy. I've not told anyone about this yet, but I've just got a pair of 1176s. But heavily modded 1176s that have got the okay. complete like very heavy transformer based inputs like class like the 1176 revision a inputs oh. uh, they've been modded so they've got a slow release mode which you can click in oh cool um, they've also been modded so that the ratios are different so it's got 2 4 8 and 20 right okay cuz no one ever uses 12 apparently but having 2 is a nice option and okay. cool. well it means you can use them in more situations i mean yeah, it, it still does that thing it always did but also does an, an extra new thing yeah which i thought was really cool and yeah it's also got this really clever stereo link thing and that the normal ones don't do where it doesn't go wonky enough to one side it, it properly like yeah. sums the stereo sides together and oh cool yeah, so you don't get weird pulling to one side. So you can actually use 1176 as, as bus compressors. Which nice. I'm like going to try it, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if, even if I don't like it, I mean, hey, I've got them as you know what I you intended them to be, which is 76s, vintage 76s. Yeah. And yeah, I got them for an absolute bargain because one of my friends who's up in Bradford... Uh, sold them to me on the condition that he can now take that money and build himself this crazy 3U dual 1176 unit. Jeez. Yeah, I know. It's a bit like, wait, okay. what? But yeah, yeah, apparently there's a schematic for a unit you can build where you can stuff two of them in the same box and blah. However he's doing it, I mean, good luck to him. That's his project because... His studio's closed too on lockdown, but that's his thing. Is wow. he's been building acoustic, designing for everybody, and building circuits for everybody, and cool. his time. <laughs> uh, another question. Yeah, I've always wondered something about transformers. Everyone keeps talking about what huge difference they make, but don't provide direct audio comparisons. Do they really? I think they do. Uh, but mm. the problem with transformers is there's so many different types of them. They do different things yeah. depending on how much level you send to them. It's very difficult to do straight up audio comparisons because yeah. to do that, you would have to completely rewire all your equipment to not have transformers in. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a fair test if you had three different transformers in three different units because with analog gear, they could all be reacting technically differently just yeah. because the difference so to make it a fair comparison you can poke holes through for all, all day long yeah plus so it gets a bit transformers don't necessarily make things sound better they make things sound different yeah. i personally really like the way that that audio transformers do a certain subtle thing to audio uh and it's nothing to do with numbers it, they just, they zing is the way I would describe it. I know when I'm listening to a vocal that's been recorded through a microphone with a big fat transformer in it, through yeah. a, through usually a valve 
preamp with big transformers through a vintage 1176 that's got big transformers in into a mixing yeah. desk that's got big transformers on the input that chain right there does a thing that i call the tube zing where it's not mostly yeah. it's mostly not the tube that's doing the zing it's mostly all those transformers in the signal chain that all saturate in a specific way that i can yeah. hear that i like that, that does a thing that, that I find quite satisfying. Um, it's, whereas if, if I was to go for something like that Lewitt 440 microphone, which is transformerless, through a super modern transformerless uh, preamp, yeah. that would still sound great. It would just sound different. It would sound yeah. super clean. And um, it's funny that, one of the times that I found that transformers make for a bad, excuse me, a bad time is if you've got a really nice, uh, really nicely driven set of transformers in, in the signal chain, it gives you that zing at a certain frequency, the, the frequency that yeah. tracks the frequency of the vocal. So it's hard to tell apart when you put auto tune on that, it makes the uh. person sound like a robot. Yeah, because, because it, you can hear that zing. That, yeah. yeah, you can hear that zing perfectly in pitch, and your ear tracks it. So when there's heavy auto tune and transformer zing, because the person recording went to a really nice studio with really nice mics yeah. and preamps, which usually really nice means really expensive, means really old. Yeah. If we're talk, if we're being honest with ourselves, if you take a non techie musician, give them a big budget, that's probably what they're going to gravitate towards. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and anyway, that's getting off track a little. But yeah, when you hear that kind of thing, that to me is that's transformer buzz. But when it's auto tuned, your ear picks it up and you go, oh, no. Whereas yeah. if that's not in there, if it's a much more modern, clean sound that's being auto tuned, you still hear it, yeah. but your ear doesn't latch on to that mid range zingy thing. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, auto tune is auto tune, and it does what it does. But with, yeah. if there's that transformer saturation, he zing in That's the vocal, your ear catches it. Yeah, mm. your your ear grabs onto that frequency and goes, "Oh, I don't like this." Yeah. Whereas without it, it makes a vocal sound kind of present at the same time as usually a big thick low end. Because transformers, again, they saturate a little bit in that kind of area. Yeah. You don't want too much transformer saturation because you end up with a horrible kind of mushiness to a sound. But yeah, it's another reason why... I, their color. Yeah, it's another reason why valve guitar amps are so popular. It's not necessarily to do with the valves. It's to do with the transformer. Mm. The output transformer turns that multiple hundreds of volts from the, the valves into something that a speaker can use and reacts with that speaker and it resonates at certain frequencies yeah. that make a guitar amp sound the way it sounds and yeah again it's it's so hard to put into words but generally again if you find a guitarist who says i like a valve amp and i don't like a solid state amp it's usually a transformer thing by and large yeah I mean, the valves have some bearing on it, but yeah, that's it. It's hard to put, it's hard to put actual like audio examples on because, like you say, there's no there's no way to do a fair test. No. And if you just have one transformer in in a whole circuit and you turn it on and off, you're not going to hear very much difference. No, exactly. It's, to, it's to them, the, yeah how, how to do it really is yeah. It? And then most people watching the video will be like, "Oh, it didn't make a difference." It's like, yeah, it did. Yeah. It was just so subtle on its own but then if you've got a signal chain that's got seven or eight transformers in driven quite hard over every single track suddenly the difference is night and day yeah yeah so yes there you go that's that hopefully has goes some way to answering why there aren't just videos on it because it's a very intangible thing and a very difficult thing to uh quantify mm. so yes um We'll leave it there for today, and we'll see you all in two weeks. There will be videos on the channel in the meantime. I have content ready to go. Like I said, we've got uh, two interviews and uh, the thing about Game Station. I'm going to put all of those on Patreon tonight so that our patrons can see them straight away. 
as our thank you to them for supporting us. I did see a new patron this week, so thank you to the new patron. And yes, I will see you all very soon. And thanks to Chris for helping out here, because Liam couldn't make it this week. And we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Hey, everyone. That might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server. Link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Hop Pole Studios. See you there.